seal meat for supper? A BC group is calling for a West Coast sealers seal group is calling for an increased seal hunt and even a Hunters possible calling call. for more licenses and a possible seal call to combat a growing population off Newfoundland. My worry is a potential seal or sea lion cull will have disastrous effects. You cannot credibly predict what the ecosystem consequences would be. The fact is there is no scientific evidence that a seal cull would actually have the effect that is intended. Seals and sea lions. To many, they are the dogs of the sea. Cute, playful, and smart. To others, including many fishermen, they are the scourge of our oceans. Troublesome pests that do nothing but swim, breed, and eat all our fish. Which group is correct? Will these marine mammals destroy our oceans if we don't keep their populations in check? Or are they an integral part of the ocean's ecosystem and simply convenient scapegoats for the fishing industry? In the case of seals, it's easy to target them and to blame them for what is wrong with our own fisheries. It's easy for us to shoot seals rather than deal with the truth of uh, today's reality. Humans have vastly overexploited almost every ecosystem we've touched. One really good example is the overexploitation and overfishing of the Atlantic cod in the Northwest Atlantic. In 1992, after decades of overfishing, the Atlantic cod population off the coast of Newfoundland collapsed. The Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO, refused to accept responsibility for mismanaging the fishery, instead blaming the harp seals. Eventually, they stopped scapegoating the seals for causing the cod collapse. Instead, they blamed them for preventing the cod's recovery. While harp seals are at a very high level relative to what they once were, cod along the northeast coast of Newfoundland have been slowly increasing over the last decade. So we can't confidently say that predation by harp seals is negatively affecting the recovery of northern cod. Large-scale commercial seal hunting began in Newfoundland and the Maritimes in the early 18th century and eventually decimated the harp seal population. By 1971, only about a million remained. After pressure from conservationists, the DFO finally set quotas for harp seal hunting. But they were set at 150,000 to 350,000 seals almost every year, until the 2010s, when they were raised to 400,000. The seal population has rebounded since then, not due to quotas, but because animal protection campaigns to end the harp seal hunt have reduced demand for seal pelts. While fishermen continue to blame harp seals for harming the cod stock, fisheries scientists fault the DFO for continuing to allow fishing of this depleted stock. They are concerned that this fish stock is still well below the limit reference point a limit which the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization defines as the danger zone, the point beyond which fishing is no longer considered sustainable. In Canada, we have had a sustainable fisheries framework policy since 2009. The policy says that if a fish stock falls below this limit reference point, that removals should be kept to the lowest level possible. 
So in a fisheries context, that would mean no targeted fishery. But we have had situations and we continue to have situations where the government goes against its own policy. And Northern Cod off Newfoundland is a prime example. Over the last 10 years where we have seen some positive signs of, a, of a cod increasing in abundance, we have also seen the quota creep up. Northern cod is estimated to be at less than half of its limit reference point. So it's not even at that limit. And yet, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans announced a 30% quota increase on cod. Many fishermen refuse to accept any responsibility for the failure of the northern cod stock to recover, instead placing all the blame on harp seals. Fisheries scientists say that there may be an additional factor preventing the recovery of northern cod, a lack of the cod's most important prey, capelin. The capelin population crashed along with the cod and has not recovered due to environmental conditions and a lack of their preferred prey. Yet DFO fishery managers allow fishermen to catch tens of thousands of tons of capelin each year. How much fishing is too much for a depleted species? To answer that question, you need to know how many fish are out there. Capelin have certainly fluctuated over time. Uh, we don't have extremely good methods to estimate the abundance of capelin. I think sometimes some people uh, have presented information on capelin which suggests we have more confidence and more knowledge about trends in capelin than we actually do. Though harp seals and cod coexisted in high numbers for millennia, fishermen may never stop scapegoating seals for damage they cause themselves. Declines in abundance and collapses of fisheries typically happen through overfishing and the effects of climate. Particularly where those two factors act together, we do observe collapses of fish populations. And again, I'm not aware of any documented cause where this was caused by predation from seals or sea lions. It's a different story in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. Here, the cod population has also been ravaged by overfishing, but even though cod fishing has been greatly reduced over the past two decades, the stock is still in steep decline. DFO scientists blame gray seals for preventing this southern cod stock from recovering. They theorize that the males venture farther from their island home than the females to target cod congregating near Cape Breton Island during the winter. Some fisheries scientists question the idea that feeding by some members of one specific species, such as gray seals, could alone prevent the cod recovery. We have unrealistic expectations about how rapidly stocks re rebound after they've been depleted so dramatically. This concept that um, one species in an ecosystem where there are so many predators, there are there are cetaceans, there's all sorts of whale species, there's sharks, there's large tuna and billfish, and other predatory fish that are eating other fish. To try and think of it as a single species predator um, affecting this huge multiple set of interactions is simply naive. Populations, after they have become depleted, so they're much smaller than they used to be, um, by definition become more vulnerable to all factors that affect them. Whether it's fishing, whether it's predation by seals, whether it's climate change, small populations are more sensitive to change and all of these factors than large populations. So that's a key point, particularly from the context that many of our commercially exploited fish populations declined by 90, 95%. So that has put them in a very vulnerable zone. One issue that DFO scientists may have dismissed too quickly is whether many cod might be dying from disease. Although testing has been inconsistent, between 2000 and 2008, many different diseases were found on several hundred cod in the Gulf and Scotian Shelf. Parasite infestations were also found, and scientists concluded that these infestations could contribute to increases in death rates of cod. 
DFO results also hinge on data about the diet of gray seals. These studies have produced a wide variety of conclusions, usually showing very little cod in their meals. Gray seals are generalist feeders, and their feeding on cod is, varies quite a bit seasonally. Uh, it varies across the sexes where males are much larger and take much longer feeding migrations, and it varies geographically. And certainly their diets will reflect the availability of fishes in the water adjacent to their haul out areas and in their feeding grounds. To survive in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, seals need to consume lots of calories to maintain their blubber stores. Research has shown that harp and gray seals mostly feed on small fatty fish that they need to build up their fat reserves for the winter. So these include herring, sand lance, capelin, and other small fish that are generally not of major commercial interest. Cod is a low-fat fish. For a seal, Atlantic mackerel, capelin, Atlantic herring, and Atlantic salmon with their higher fat content are more nutritious. If a fishery on a alternate prey of gray seals is suppressing that prey's abundance, certainly a, some management of that fishery to reduce that catch and allow that alternate prey to increase could benefit the cod stock potentially by switching the gray seals' attention to that uh, fish species. Seals and Atlantic cod also share some ideal prey species, including capelin, herring, and mackerel. But these preferred food species are suffering from overfishing and environmental damage caused by humans. Restoring these species would be another step towards improving the cod condition and would reduce predation by seals by giving them more choice in their diet. But that is not happening. The DFO admits that the mackerel stock plummeted due to overfishing and is still in the critical zone. Yet fishing continues. Herring is also in the critical zone, and estimates of the stock size are poor. Yet fishing continues. And the Atlantic salmon population has been devastated by dams, habitat destruction, overfishing, invasive species, and the escape of farmed salmon. The bottom line is, we cannot say for sure that gray seals are causing the cod population in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence to decline, but we can say that mismanagement of fisheries has been and continues to be a problem. The problem of overfishing and the scapegoating of seals is not limited to the chilly waters of the North Atlantic. This drama is repeated with different players on the opposite side of the continent, the west coast of Canada and the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Here, salmon is the most prized catch and has been a constant source of conflict for decades because, like Atlantic cod, wild salmon populations have declined critically. Some fishermen claim that this decline is caused by seals and sea lions. Are these marine mammals really to blame for the decline in salmon populations? Or are there other factors involved? The salmon decline in the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia and Alaska, is not a new phenomenon. As the human population grew in those areas, economic development took place, land use changed, there was all kinds of human activities, the salmon populations declined. It's happened every place on the planet that you've altered the habitat, you will get declines in runs of salmon. Humans, not sea lions, have been responsible for destroying salmon habitats in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia, beginning with the 1848 gold rush, when miners sluiced for gold in salmon streams. Then, heavy industrial-scale fishing took a toll, and today, humans continue to destroy salmon habitats with irrigation, dams, roads, housing, pollution, and more. If you looked at the 1850 habitat and looked at the habitat now, you'd say, wow, how can we have any salmon here? Fishery managers have tried to help salmon by building fish bypasses to help them get around dams. But seals and sea lions will naturally seek the easiest catch. 
Often, this means hunting where pathways for salmon have been restricted by these narrow fish bypasses. Some fishery managers say the sea lions are critically harming endangered salmon in this way. But fishery scientists don't necessarily agree. It's not among the major effects on the salmon runs, but it is a measurable effect. In the open ocean, in areas where you don't have these engineering constructions, I think the effect of seals and sea lions would be limited. It would just be one of many effects on a salmon run. Can salmon runs be restored without slaughtering sea lions? Scientists say the answer is simple. The simplest way to bring them back would be to reduce the human footprint. The technical solution is relatively simple. Now, politically, it's very difficult to do. Uh, people don't want to give up their hot showers, lose their hydropower, for example. They don't tend to want to lose their roads. They don't want to uh, lose their schools because those are oftentimes built on salmon habitat. Uh, they don't want to uh, lose their ski resorts because those are oftentimes adversely affecting salmon areas. So irrigated agriculture probably would have to go away because that has an adverse effect on salmon. Basically, everything the humans do adversely affects wild salmon. Still, there are things we can do right now to increase salmon populations and thus help the sea lions without giving up our homes, roads, and hot water. Raising salmon in hatcheries and releasing them for fishermen to catch is one example. However, this can harm wild salmon, since the hatchery salmon compete for food. Something else that we can do is restore the seals and sea lions' alternative prey, such as herring. There has been some studies in, in Puget Sound with sea lions feeding on, on salmon, uh, because they believe there is no herring available. Herring and anchovy are nutritionally richer than salmon for, for most pinnipeds because of their uh, content in lipids and some particular fatty acids. So whenever herring and anchovy are available for the, f uh, for the sea lions to eat, they will prefer to eat these fish rather than salmon. Herring are important not only for seals and sea lions, but also for salmon, as well as whales, seabirds, and many other species. But under DFO management, the herring stock in British Columbia has crashed. Some of the loudest voices of hostility towards seals and sea lions are those of herring fishermen. These voices cry out, Kill them all! Shoot more! Keep the kills coming! They see seals and sea lions frolicking in the ocean and on shore, sometimes stealing fish from their nets and off their hooks, and they conclude that these animals are overpopulated. For these fishermen, like the Atlantic fishermen, reducing their catch is not an option. They believe that only a cull or harvest of seals or sea lions will bring back the fish. Anybody that says that seals and sea lions, anything else, needs to be culled because they're eating more than their share or more than fishermen, that's a political call. That's not a scientific one. If you're looking for that to, quote, solve the problem, bring back salmon, not going to happen. But are these marine mammals overpopulated, as fishermen claim? Somehow the jargon has gotten out there that seals and sea lions are overpopulated. They're not overpopulated. I don't think there's a clear indication that any of the species in Canada currently are overpopulated in the sense that they're exceeding their carrying capacity. Most species are still recovering from previous uh, overhunting in the past. For example, gray seals are, and they haven't reached their carrying capacity yet. We typically see a nice little balance taking shape after the recovery of a species, and that's exactly what we've seen here in British Columbia with the harbor seals. We've seen a recovery from artificial lows in the early 1970s to natural historical levels in the 1990s, but that was a recovery to natural historical abundance. We haven't seen a change in the harbor seal population in British Columbia since they got back to the natural historical abundance, which is a, a striking uh, example of how Mother Nature says, there are enough of you guys, uh, you've reached your carrying capacity, let's, let's get on with things. Wild populations will tend to, to stabilize themselves uh, when they reach the, um, a certain number that the system can sustain. It's human populations, the ones that need to be managed. Though seals and sea lions are not overpopulated, could a cull still have a positive impact on the fish species? 
I think it's fair to say that again, the scientific evidence of where culls have taken place in the past has yielded no clear uh, benefit. There's no documented case where the culling of predators had actually the intended positive effect in recovering a threatened population. There has never been a documented um, outcome of success or knowing one way or another of whether ha it had any effect whatsoever. It's also impossible to predict any ripple effects a seal or sea lion cull might have on the ocean's ecosystem. It's extremely difficult and I would say not scientifically credible to predict what the ecosystem consequences, good or bad, would be from a cull of, of seals. Some people think it's a very simple solution. Less seals means more salmon, but that's entirely untrue. Less seals might mean a lot less salmon because, for example, harbor seals eat hake. Hake is a predatory species on salmon. If you remove 50% of the seals, you are effectively removing 50% of the food for the transient killer whales. The fact is that predator-prey dynamics are complicated, ecosystems are complicated, food webs are complicated, and oftentimes seals are eating other fish that might be eating the baby fish of the prey that we want to harvest uh, in our own uh, fisheries. To sanction something like a cull when you know that there's no evidence that it will be effective um, is irresponsible in the face particularly of changing ecosystems with changing climate and all the other pressures that we have put on them. The DFO has proposed culling 73,000 gray seals on the East Coast to try to help the cod. But that would go against their own seal management policy and put the gray seal population in jeopardy by their own standards. Regardless of the number of seals or sea lions killed, a cull is an experiment. The trouble is that if you remove the seals this year, It'll be three, four, five years later before you see the first returns. And by the time those fish have a chance to reproduce, another three, four, or five years, next thing you know, this is an experiment that's going to take over 20 years. And anybody knows doing an experiment, you need a control. What are you comparing it to? Well, we're talking about an experiment with no control, which means that it's a very dangerous experiment because by the time 20 to 30 years have gone by, and you suddenly realize, oops, it didn't work. Uh, we no longer have seals and sea lions and our salmon are no better. Um, then what? There is no scientific evidence that killing apex predators like seals and sea lions will restore what has been destroyed by industrial scale fishing, climate change and pollution. To restore fisheries and balance to ocean ecosystems, we need to reduce the human footprint. We need to realize what our impact is, not only by overfishing, but how we treat the nearshore environment, how we use our waterways, how we um, pollute our waterways, how we've changed streams and river systems. These are all direct human impacts. Our populations are growing. We're impacting more and more. We have less and less pristine areas for animals and species to recover from. So we need to be responsible. You can help seals, sea lions, and ocean ecosystems by eating less seafood or none at all, doing your part to keep plastic, other waste, and chemicals like pesticides and herbicides out of rivers and oceans, and supporting habitat restoration for salmon. Contact your local representatives and let them know that culling seals and sea lions is not the way to restore healthy oceans. We've only scratched the surface in this short film. Please visit scapegoatseals.org for more information, including more from Professor Lackey on wild salmon, hatcheries, and salmon farms, video of Dr. Helena saving a seal who was shot by fishermen, and other fisheries scientists discussing ways to make fisheries sustainable. You'll also find actions that you can take today, including emails to send to your local officials. Seals and sea lions have been scapegoated for decades. As the human population grows, with little effort to reduce our impacts on the ocean and on the climate, with continued overfishing decimating species, we can expect the scapegoating to increase. 
You can educate yourself and speak out, pressuring those in power to make the right changes. Instead of targeting animals who have coexisted with others in their ecosystems for millennia. for many people, if they could have it, they would want to turn it back to the early 1970s, after the whaling had removed all the whales, after the culling had reduced seals and sea lions down to record low numbers, after the bombing had stopped of their breeding sites. Um, that's the world they'd like to see again. That's not what the world that I see out there today. I see a world full of life, and I see people coming from all over the world that want to go on these wildlife encounters. They want to get out there to see killer whales. They want to go see the humpback whales, the gray whales that have come in here. Uh, they want to see the dolphins and the seals and sea lions. We market it in a way for the world to come to experience this incredible natural beauty. And yet we have some people who don't share in that whatsoever. They like to see basically an ocean that on the surface is devoid of life, but underneath they know they can catch that last salmon. And I find that really disturbing. And I think it's time for us to have a new conversation about this ocean that we share. How do we want to share? Is it us first and everything else in the ocean second? Um, it's not the same as it was in the 70s. And yet these, these calls by people to call and reduce and turn the ocean back, um, it's, it's a really worrying thing because where do you stop? And maybe we take the seals out first, but only got to get rid of the humpback whales, the killer whales, um, the blue herons, they eat some salmon smolts. We got birds. Where do we stop? And I think it's just the tip of an iceberg of madness if you start talking about turning the ocean back to a point in time when it was clearly being overexploited. Um, but it's being done under this, I think, fairly naive belief that but we can manage it. We've got computers and we write models and we can predict. But I think it's quite naive to think that, that we have that level of control. When we look at the ocean and realize in the end, um, we have very, very little control over anything except how much we take out and how much we put in. And I think we have to keep that in mind. <laughs>